Coming up on We Talk Nerdy, I've got the tech news of the week, I'm going to answer some email, and I'm going to continue my discussion on how you can upgrade an old computer. That and more coming up next on We Talk Nerdy. We Talk Nerdy. WeTalkNerdy.tv is sponsored by UBU Enterprises, specializing in custom business website design, social media marketing, and online branding strategies for companies and products. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode three of We Talk Nerdy TV. I'm your host, Dave Larson, and this is a show where we talk about tech news, reviews, and how to's. This is the first show I've done since our website went live earlier this week. So if you've had trouble getting there, uh, it's up and working now. It's fully functional. And I'd like to say a special thanks to everyone who showed up on launch day uh, to wish us well. In the news this week, Google showed off Glass Apps for Gmail, News, Evernote, and Path at the South by Southwest conference earlier this week. That's all well and good, but there's nothing really earth-shattering about their demo. What struck me most about it were the design goals. Google said that there are four design principles. Design for glass, don't get in the way, keep it timely, and avoid the unexpected. This is perfect pitch, in my opinion. Glass should, could be really annoying if you've got stuff popping up in your peripheral vision all the time, and I'm glad that they're taking this approach. And in other news, Poor old Electronic Arts. The bad press for SimCity just keeps getting worse and worse. Electronic Arts, publisher of SimCity, issued an apology last week, stating that a lot more people logged on than was expected. As I previously reported on the blog, SimCity launch didn't go exactly as planned. Issues over slow and burdened servers led EA to disable some of the game's less important features, like leaderboards, and in an effort to increase excuse me, in an effort to increase performance. In addition, Electronic Arts is offering a free game as compensation. EA has gotten a lot of criticism over the last uh, week or two that um, because SimCity requires an always-on internet connection in order to play. The official story is that servers are doing some of the work required to run the game. But that turns out maybe isn't true. The quote from EA was, it wouldn't be possible to make the game offline without a significant amount of re-engineering work on our part. Meanwhile, a developer reportedly told the website Rock Paper Shotgun that, quote, the servers are not handling any of the computation done to simulate the city you're playing. I have no idea why they're claiming otherwise. This seemed to be confirmed when a hacker figured out how to enable a special debug mode, which uh, makes the game uh, uh, work without a connection to a server. The upshot here is that SimCity could have been designed without uh, using an active internet connection, but it wasn't. Most likely, this was done to help combat piracy. Electronic Arts should have just been honest about it. Now they've just got a lot of bad press and some angry users. I hope that things will improve for them and the users of SimCity down the road. In an update to my review last week of the Roku LT, the Roku 3 was released. The Roku 3 is faster, and it has a new interface, and it sports a nifty uh, headphone jack on the remote control for private listening. If you already have a Roku 2, a Roku HD, a Roku LT, or Roku steaming stri stick, streaming stick, <laughs> You should be getting a new interface uh, upgrade soon, uh, automatically via firmware update, sometime in April. The new Roku interface over, uh, offers the following benefits over the previous interface. There's a new layout with more intuitive, faster navigation, more channels per screen, and an upgraded channel store with 750 plus channels and improved one-stop search. Hopefully I can get one in here and I can review it for you guys. It would seem that between 2008 and 2010, while Google Street View so crews were out collecting Street View images, they also recorded data from unsecured wireless networks. After a three-year investigation, Google has agreed to settle the matter by paying $7 million to 38 different states where the incidents occurred. They've agreed to destroy the data in question, and Google claims that the data collected was the mistake 
in an experimental bit of code uh, that was on their computer. Google said that the data they collected was unintentional, and I would tend to believe them. Really, I think this is kind of a non-story. It's been widely reported in the press, but I think the real story is that you need to secure your wireless network. There's a place in this world for open Wi-Fi networks like Starbucks and so on, uh, but in a day and age when internet service providers will cripple your internet if you, internet, if you are caught downloading copyrighted materials, you can't afford to let strangers access your Wi-Fi. It's sad that it, it's come to that. I used to share my network uh, when I lived in Manhattan with the people around me, but I don't think I can afford to do that anymore. So put a password on your wireless network, keep it secure. Also in the news, Blizzard released StarCraft II Heart of the Swarm, and I promptly stayed up half the night playing it. If you like StarCraft, you're probably all over it already. Uh, for the rest of you, StarCraft is a real-time strategy game for the PC where you raise little virtual armies to fight other little virtual armies. I like it. It's a fun game. Um, and if it sounds like something you'd be interested in, you'll have no trouble learning about it uh, on blizzard.com or quite frankly, you could just Google it and find lots of information about it. Also in the news last week, Andy Rubin stepped down as head of Android at Google. There's no shortage of speculation this week about what this might mean. Uh, it could mean that Andy will be leaving Google. Uh, it could mean that he's going to stay at Google and work on something new. Maybe after 10 years of Android, he needs a new challenge. I know I would. The new head of Android is Sundar Pachai, who currently heads up development on the Chrome browser and Chrome OS. It'll be interesting to see if this means that Chrome OS and Android will merge in some way, but Google has said absolutely nothing on the matter. Um, Andy, brilliant, Andy Rubin is a brilliant guy, and I hope he stays at Google and brings us something new and cool. And last but not least, uh, the Samsung Galaxy S4 was released at an event held at Radio City Music Hall on Thursday. By all accounts, it was weird and a little sexist. Uh, I posted a link to it on the website and check it out if you like. As near as I can tell, it looks like it's a pretty cool phone. Um, personally, I carry a Samsung Galaxy Nexus, and I'm not sure I'd like all the standard, all the non-standard apps that they put on the S4, but I'm interested in finding out more. Hopefully some hands-on reports will show up soon. I'm going to start off this week by answering an email. Uh, because the answer relates directly to the next story I'm going to tell you about. MD in NJ writes, I have a two terabyte external hard drive that I use to back up pictures and document. But what's the best way to back up Windows and my applications? So what you want to do is back up everything on your computer so that in case of some catastrophic failure, you're okay, right? You can restore your computer. Well, in order to do that, the first thing you need to do is have some place to put your backup, like an external drive that you already have. Um, you could also put the information onto DVDs, um, but that takes a long time and it's not very efficient. If you're serious about backing up your data, and you should be, some kind of external hard drive is a really good option. If you don't have one, you can get them relatively inexpensive on a number of places like Amazon or Newegg. If you're not sure what to get, send me an email and I'll try to help. The second thing you need is a program to do the backup. Now, Windows, Windows may have a built-in option for you to do that, but I don't really like the Windows the way Windows does it because Windows only allows you to save one backup at a time. So I'm going to recommend a free alternative and show you step-by-step -step how to use it. Now, what you're trying to do is called image a disk. In the bad old days, you used to need a program like Norton Ghost to do something like this. The reason is that Windows for a long time couldn't be backed up while it was also running. So you had to use something like Norton Ghost to boot from a CD or a DVD or even a floppy disk. Remember those? But Microsoft introduced a, te a technology called Shadow Copy to make backing up a running version of Windows a possibility. The program I use to back up my system is called Macrium Reflect. Now, there's a free version and a couple of different paid versions, and if you like it, I suggest supporting the developers and buying it. But the free version is actually pretty capable. 
you can download it on your own. First go to www.macrium.com and click on Downloads Free Edition. Scroll down to the bottom of the page and you can download Macrium Reflect for free from CNET. Uh, now go ahead, download and install and run the program. At the top of the screen, you're going to see tabs for disk image, restore, and log. Each, the disk image tab is the one we want. Each partition on your computer is represented on this screen. A partition is simply a part of a hard drive. A hard drive can be divided into one or more partitions. And as you see here, my first drive is where Windows lives, and you can see that from the Windows icons here. There is a partition for the C drive and a special partition, hi random, special partition uh, that Windows uses, it's called system reserved partition. If you wanna back up all your drives, you choose backup image local drives from the menu. If you just want to back up Windows by itself, you can choose Backup, Backup Windows. Now, Macrium Reflect uses two different terminologies for backups, uh, imaging, and cloning. Imaging means backing up data into a file. It's kind of like a giant zip file, and it's stored someplace uh, either on a hard drive or, if you want, on a series of DVDs. Cloning means making an exact copy of a drive or partition onto another drive. And basically that means you wanna take one drive and make an exact copy of it on another drive so the two are indistinguishable. Uh, what we're gonna do is drive imaging. Yes. So I'm going to choose backup image local drives. And I'm presented with a window that allows me to choose which drives to backup and where the resulting disk image will be stored. For this example, I'm just going to back up Windows, which means I just select the two Windows partitions. If I wanted to back up everything, I just click the other drives. One thing to remember when you're doing this is if you're backing up to a hard drive, don't click the checkbox for that drive. You don't wanna back up your backup to the backup drive. That would be bad. If you're backing up to a CD or DVD, then you can choose that here also. I'm going to just back up a hard drive. So I just click the drives I want to back up, and then I tell Macrium Reflect where I want to store the backup. I recommend that you create a folder that's meaningful to you, and then just let Macrium Reflect name the files however it wants to. Go ahead and click Next, and you're presented with a summary of what's going to be backed up. When you click Finish, the backup will start, and you can go do something else for a while. This process generally takes some time. Reflect will give you a generalized guess as to how long it might take. Often, your best bet is to start the backup and then go to bed, and you'll have your system completely backed up by morning. Restoration of a disk is the same process in reverse. You can tell Macrium Reflect which image you want to restore, and where it should restore to, and it'll do the rest. Thank you for the email, MD and NJ. Remember, if you have questions or problems and you need answers, email us here at wetalknerdy.tv at gmail.com. Going to take a little break, and I'd like to tell you about UBU Enterprises. Do you need a website for your small business? Maybe you need help managing your business's social media. UBU Enterprises can help you. They have helped me a ton. They took my ideas, added in their own flair for design and execution, and helped me to get my website exactly where I wanted it to be. I could not have done it without them. And the best part is that they're still helping me make sure that my website runs smoothly. You need their help? You can contact them at ubuenterprises.com. Right, random. In this week's how-to episode, looks like Random and I are going to show you uh, the continuing story of how to upgrade your computer. In last week's episode, I showed you a couple of ways you can upgrade an old computer, and I used this Dell laptop as an example. Well, the new hard drive and the new memory are here, and I'm gonna show you how to install them. Got the memory and the hard drive, and but first, 
I want to back up my computer using Mac Rim Reflect, which is why I answered that email earlier. That way, if something goes horribly wrong, I have a working system image that I can restore from. Now, with the backup done, I need to do one more thing before I start. I need to have an operating system ready to install on the new hard drive. Last week, we talked about installing Windows 8, or you could use something called Puppy Linux. Now, we've already created uh, installation disks for both Windows 8 and Puppy Linux, so I'm ready to go. But let me take you through the steps for creating an installation disk. The process is the same for either OS, and you just download a special kind of file called an ISO, and then you make a DVD from that. Uh, an ISO is kind of like a zip file. It's one big file that contains the contents of a CD or DVD uh, in a special format. And if you're going to install Windows, for example, you download the ISO, ISO file uh, from Microsoft as part of your purchase process for Windows. If you're installing Puppy Linux, you can download the ISO for free from puppylinux.org. I've chosen a version of Puppy Linux called Precise Puppy. Either way, once you have an ISO file, you need to burn a disk. If you have CD or DVD burning software like Nero, you already have what you need. Uh, you can just load those files into Nero and burn a DVD with the ISO. If not, never fear, there is a terrific free program available for burning disks uh, on Windows called Free ISO Burner, and you can get it from freeisoburner.com. Just download and run the program, and it will ask you to locate the ISO file that you've already saved to your hard drive. Uh, then you just put in a DVD and click the Burn button. In a few minutes, you will have a bootable installation disk. So let's put in our new hardware. First, power off the computer, unplug it from the wall, and in the case of this laptop, I'm going to remove the battery as well. Now, when you're handling sensitive electronics, you want to be careful of static electricity. I've never had a problem with it, but you can ruin a piece of sensitive electronics if it gets zapped with a bit of static. So uh, it's best to make sure that you're not doing this kind of thing on a uh, really dry day. And if you're really concerned, you can even put on a grounding wrist strap that will keep you grounded and prevent a static shock. Um, I'm going to show you how to install the memory first. In the case of this laptop, <clears throat> you simply unscrew the plate marked with an M for memory. The old memory modules are held in place with little springs. Just depress the springs, slide out the old memory, and slide in the new. The memory modules have little notches in them, so you can only install them in one direction. Close it back up, and you're done. The hard drive on this computer is marked with a little cylinder icon. Just remove the screws holding it in place, and a little carrier slides right out. Take out the old drive, insert the new one, and you're done. These parts are modular and pretty easy to replace. Now, we're ready to install our new operating system. Whether you choose Windows 8 or Puppy Linux, the steps are basically the same. Turn on the computer and insert the installation disk. Now, at this point, your computer may or may not boot from the DVD in the drive. You may have to tell it explicitly that you want to boot from the CD or DVD. Most computers have a screen that pops up at the very beginning with some information on how to change where the operating system is going to boot from. On this Dell, it's F2. Your computer may use a different function key like F12. So as soon as I see that notice, I hit F2, and it'll ask me what device I want to boot from. I just pick the CD-DV drive, and it'll boot from there. If you're installing Windows, the Windows installer will launch and take you through the setup guide step by step. Puppy Linux does things just a little bit differently. Puppy Linux actually lets you run the operating system right off the disk. You don't need a hard drive at all. In fact, you could uh, have a broken computer with no hard drive in it at all and still run Puppy Linux. If you want, you can, this is great because if you, if, even if you do have an operating system on there, you can run Puppy Linux off the CD or DVD and never even worry about the hard drive. So you can try it out without having to jump in headfirst. 
CD DVD drives are pretty slow and it would be better if you could run Puppy Linux from your hard drive or yes, from your hard drive or from a flash drive. So I'm going to show you how to set up Puppy Linux on a flash drive. You just need the Puppy Linux installation disk and a copy of the original ISO that you downloaded that you made the installation disk from. So to make this easy, I have a flash drive I'm going to use as my Puppy Linux boot drive, and I'm going to put a copy of the Puppy Linux ISO on this other flash drive. Now, all I have to do is start Puppy Linux from the DVD, then I'm going to click on Menu, Setup, Boot Flash Install, Puppy to USB. Then you just follow the on-screen instructions, and when you're finished, you're going to have a, a flash drive with Puppy Linux on it, and you can boot directly from that on many computers. Now, I haven't had much time to spend with Puppy Linux as I've been busy launching a website and recording this show, but my initial impressions are very positive. Puppy Linux is very fast and it's very easy to set up. In fact, it does most of the work for you. If you're a Linux fan or if you have an older, slower computer, I think Puppy Linux is a great choice. It's great to keep a disk like this around even if you aren't using it. You can, if your hard drive fails uh, completely, you could still start up your computer with Puppy and use the included tools and maybe recover your system. So it's a good thing to keep these things around as an emergency backup. As I get more time, I'll try and come back to Puppy Linux and show you more about it. If you're curious about Linux in general, you might want to visit the linuxsite.wordpress.com. Robert M. has been kind enough to post links to our show on his blog, and he's got all the latest Linux news right there. So check it out. Now that I've gotten my new hard drive memory and operating systems, I thought I should perform some benchmark tests to see if my upgrades actually made my system any faster. My first non-scientific benchmark is boot time. There are a number of factors that influence boot time, so it's not really a fair test, but it's useful information nonetheless. Obviously, the faster your computer boots, the happier you're going to be. It took Windows XP 38.9 uh, seconds to boot from my standard parallel interface uh, two and a half inch hard drive. It took Windows 8 21.8 seconds to boot from the uh, solid state hard drive that I just put in, and it took Puppy Linux 46 and a half seconds to boot from a flash disk. Now, I know that Puppy Linux would definitely boot faster if I installed it onto my hard drive, which is something I may save for a experiment further down the road. But for now, Windows 8 is the clear boot time winner. I ran some hard drive benchmarks too. I used some free benchmarking software uh, called Crystal Disk Mark. If you want to try it out, you can get it at the URL at the bottom of your screen. This benchmark is an objective measurement of the speed of the drive for various types of read and write tests. I ran three sets of tests, and the results on the left are for my laptop with the old hard drive. The middle set of tests are with the new solid state drive, and the last set of numbers show the same benchmark tests run on my desktop system, which has a serial ATA solid state hard drive. As you can see, the new SSD is definitely faster than the old standard hard drive, anywhere from 2.2 to 4 point, or sorry, 5.4 times faster, depending on the kind of test. It's a far cry from my more modern desktop computer, but I think it's a worthy investment and it should give this old laptop a little more life. Right, Random? Well, that's it for this week. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Next week, I'm going to introduce you to the Raspberry Pi. I'll give you the rundown on what it is and what it's good for uh, on the next We Talk Nerdy. And remember, if you have questions or problems and you need answers, send us an email at wetalknerdy.tv at gmail.com. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next Monday.
Bitte ist Challenge Meister. 